Don't think so. Don't think so. No. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's meeting. Before I introduce our speaker, I would just like to remind you that our next meeting is actually the joint meeting with the old gala club, and it's in Gala Shields, and it starts at 7.30. Now, if you're a member of the Antiquarians, you just take your little book across and you get into the queen. What better reason to buy a little book? <laughs> 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 but um, I'm sure we'll all get a warm welcome, whoever would like to turn up. Now, if you would require a lift, please let Jean, anyone on the committee, please let us know and we'll try and arrange lifts. So, if that's okay, at the end of the meeting, if you just get in touch with us, we'll be able to do something about it. Right then, now on to tonight's speaker, Mr Ian, is it, is he? I must get my glasses on, <laughs> Mr Ian McDougall. Now, Mr McDougall tells me, I'll call you Ian because we're a very informal lot here, uh, <laughs> uh, has been a teacher, a teacher of history and a lecturer, and he is also a writer of many social history books, including titles such as Bondagers, <coughs> We are brethren, um, voices from war, to name but a few. And his latest printed book is Voices of Lily's Leaf. Now, that is a oral history of life and times in the village. And I've just asked Mr McDougall why he chose Lily's Leaf. And it's because he was evacuated there 50 years ago. So, and it obviously holds very happy memories for me. So tonight, please welcome Mr. McDougall. I'm sorry to begin with a small correction, but I was invited to go to 75. Oh, yeah. I did think as I was saying that, <laughs> time has passed quickly. <laughs> about their youth. Uh, with those words, the historian a Professor A.G.P. Taylor, years ago, dismissed the usefulness, the value of oral history. That's to say of history based on spoken recollections recorded in interviews uh, rather than based on documents such as minutes, letters, diaries, census returns, newspapers, and so on. Well, the publisher's blurb for this book uh, describes it as an oral history of life and work in the Scottish border village of Liddesleaf, as your chair person has said, and that it covers the 20th century. So, is this book merely a collection of droolings of old men? Well, all I can say is I hope not. <laughs> the book is indeed very much based on the spoken word and edited recollections recorded a couple of decades ago uh, of 21 of Lily's Leaf's then older inhabitants or former inhabitants, and their recollections were all recorded at interviews between 1991 and 1924. And of the 24 men and women, uh, 16 were men and 8 were women. One of the 24 was the hereditary local large landowner, Major John Sprott of Riddle. Another was the then Church of Scotland Parish Minister, the Reverend James Watson. A third was Peter Chisholm, the village garage owner and car hire. Two others, Johnny Elliott and Stuart Todd, were retired farmers. 
Stuart Todd, originally a farmer, farm worker, had become also an agricultural contractor. A sixth man, William Haldane, better known as Len Haldane, and her underson, Mrs. Haldane, his widow, lives in Selkirk now. Uh, he was a time served and experienced baker who, in the 1960s, had transformed the village bakery into a general grocery business. Mary Preston, one of the eight women, and whose parents had run from the 1920s to the 1970s, a newsagent come grocery shop at Lily's Leaf, had herself, on leaving school, trained as a nurse and became a highly qualified and experienced one and a member of the Edinburgh medical team associated with the distinguished professor, Sir John Crofton. He had a, a, a leading part in the discovery that if, don't ask me what the drugs were, but if three drugs were taken simultaneously, tuberculosis ceased to be the terrible scourge throughout Scotland and indeed throughout the world that it had formerly been. Two others of the eight women recorded, Pat Brown and Ellen Mills, both from Edinburgh, had been wartime land girls at or around Lillysleaf, and after the war they'd married local men and settled there. Another of the 24, Alec Lawrence, had been one of the first wartime evacuees to arrive at Lillysleaf on the 1st of September 1939 two days before uh, war on Nazi Germany, Nazi Germany, was actually declared by the British government. Alec, who had arrived then from Edinburgh, accompanied by his mother, two brothers and two sisters, attended Lillysleaf School, then went on to Hoyt High School, but remained based at Lillysleaf until he returned to Edinburgh after four years in 1943. Apart from these 10 contributors to the book, the other 14 may perhaps be described as so-called ordinary <coughs> working people. I say so-called because their recollections prove that so many of them uh, were far from ordinary. These 14 men and women had, like the other 10, a wide experience of life and work. During their working uh, lives, almost all 14 had not only had more than one job, but also more than one occupation. The largest group, six, including one woman, Christina Barney, who had come after the war from Caithness to live and work at Willys Reef, worked for some or many years as farm workers. Two of those six remained farm workers throughout their working lives, except for very brief employments in other spheres. Christina Barney herself had worked not only in the fields, but also simultaneously as a domestic servant and a milkmaid. As she herself says, I did every mortal thing. Christina died in a home in Selkirk a few years ago. The next largest group were five of the 14 who had at one time or another worked in sawmills. Four others, as forestry workers, had worked out in the woods. One of the 14, Jimmy Shortreed, had always worked as a gardener, apart from two years' service as a conscript in the Royal Navy. And three others of the 14 had also worked, at least for some years, as gardeners, a further four, all but one of them women, had worked for longer or shorter periods as shop assistants, shop workers. One of them, Jean Robinson, had begun work as an apprentice dressmaker, bicycling daily to and from her work seven miles away in Melrose. She later found employment here in Selkirk with its cooperative society, to which also she bicycled daily to and from Lily's Leaf. 
until she became a draper's shop assistant in Selberg. Around about 1926, she also became the first woman in Livesleaf to have a motorcycle, which, for the ten years she remained in that job here in Selkirk, uh, made the journey to and from the town much easier for her. Of those 14 so-called ordinary working folk interviewed and recorded, a further three were at least for some years estate workers, and three of the eight women, until they married, were domestic servants. One other man, Robert Robinson, among the 14, was always a stonemason and general building worker. So I hope all this shows the width of experience of life and employment that these folk had. So, these 24 men and women were the voices, the voices mentioned in the, the book's title, contributing their spoken recollections that form the principal, but not the only, sources on which this book is based. With all respect to A.G.P. Taylor and other critics of uh, the value, reliability and usefulness of oral history, Let's remember, too, that humankind could speak long, long before it learned to write. Well, although the book is largely based on these spoken recollections, it relies also on a range of indispensable documentary sources. These include the Lily's Leaf Church of Scotland Parish Magazine, a very helpful source, and Lily's Leaf School Log Books, no less helpful. Though the Reverend Arthur Pollock Sims' history titled The Parish of Lily's Leaf was published as early as 1913 and lacks details, nonetheless it remains worth consulting. And without the excellent detailed information provided by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, concerning those Lily's Leaf men who lost their lives in the 1914-18 or 1939-45 war, it would have been far more <coughs> difficult, if not in <coughs> some cases impossible, to explain who exactly they were, where they were killed, how the funding for the village 1914-18 war memorial was raised, and how its site was chosen. You may know that the uh, memorial stands at the um, eastern end of the, the village, just in front of what used to be the United Free Church and across the road from what used to be the post office. These and some other documentary sources appear to indicate that a total of between 62 and 72 men from Lily's Leaf were in the armed forces in the 1418 war, either as volunteers or, in a, a small number of cases, as conscripts. They included three who had emigrated to Canada shortly uh, before the outbreak of the war, but who had returned to fight as members of the Canadian forces. Of the 62 or 72, we're not quite sure uh, just how many uh, did uh, join or were obliged to join the armed forces, 62 or 72, 26 of them did not return. So that amounts to a casualty rate uh, death of be somewhere between 36 and 42 percent. Mm. Now, the Southern Reporter <coughs> um, has a report near the end of the First World War, in which it says Lily's Leaf, or indicates Lily's Leaf was fairly lucky and it hadn't suffered many casualties. Well, if that were true, it gives us, if we need the reminder, of the terrible rate of casualties in the First World War, when 36 to 42 percent of those who went off to fight did not return. 
Another irreplaceable documentary source uh, consulting and compiling the book was, of course, the Southern Reporter itself. To consult some 40 years of the Southern's back numbers, I used to come down by bus once a week from Edinburgh to the then Archive Centre at St Mary's Mill in Selkirk, which I gather has since been lost to Hoyk <laughs> and the Hub. Uh, that was during the year 96 to 97. Well, this, the Southern was, let's hope it still is, you'll know, and I don't, the Southern was, and let's hope it still is, a newspaper of record. That's to say, it appears to have done its best regularly to publish reports about events and people pretty well throughout the borders, including, of course, Lily's Leaf. Though the Southern appears now no longer to possess its records that it once had, of those whom it used to employ as its local correspondents, it seems likely that one such who reported for it for many years from Lily's Leaf until his death in 1950 was the village head teacher, Andrew Birrell. And uh, if you wanted to know more about Andrew Birrell, I'd be glad to oblige you in the period for discussions and questions at the end of the lecture. He was a remarkable man in many ways. Uh, so this book, I hope, shows not only the usefulness and value of recorded and edited spoken recollections, oral history, but also that such recollections should be checked against, supplemented, reinforced by, and closely aligned with whatever relevant documentary sources may be available. It's always very desirable, indispensable indeed, for any published uh, spoken recollections to have notes that explain, enlarge on, and where necessary correct whatever obscurities, er errors of fact, etc., the recollections may contain. Now that may be difficult, if not impossible, in cases where, say, an event, a person, or perhaps a conversation is recalled by one person, but to which item there is no other available or surviving source or witness. The reader in such a case, perhaps like a judge in a court case, must then simply decide on the general veracity and reliability of the witness. But in principle, oral history and documented history should surely be seen not as rivals, but as partners in the search for historical truth and accuracy. So I hope I've put A.G.P. Taylor in his place. <laughs> He's been dead, of course, for quite a few years, <laughs> so we're on safe grounds. Well, during the last century or so, the recording of spoken recollections through the invention and spread of tape recorders and other more recent means has become much easier. As the great majority of men and women don't write anything down about their life and work, there is consequently a huge mass of experience of information that through recorded interviews could be harvested and permanently preserved in public libraries and archive centres and similar institutions, all to the benefit of present and future generations. Now, dare I ask, Madam Chair, whether anyone here has written down uh, an account of her or his life, or intends to do so soon? No? One hand up, two hands up, good. But that's really typical, I would think, of the mass of us. You know, it's a small minority of people who ever get down We'll think about it. Once I get my holidays, I'll find the time to do it. But we never seem somehow to do it. Whatever may be the shortcomings of oral history, and arguably there are one or two, um, the shortcomings of oral history as a means of investigating aspects of the past, there's certainly nothing new 
about historians relying, at least partly, on the oral history. The ancient Greek Herodotus, often described as the father of history, traveled through Greece in the 5th century BC, gathering materials for his histories. The Penguin Classics 1954 edition of those histories says Herodotus based them on the visible evidence of buildings and monuments, as well as local chronicles written in Greek, but also on the answers given to his own interminable and highly intelligent questions by natives of the various countries he visited. So Herodotus relied to some extent on spoken recollections. To that extent, then, his work is an example of oral history. Now, in compiling the present book, I can only hope I didn't subject the elderly residents or former residents of Lily Thief to interminable questions. Still less could I claim my questions were at any stage highly intelligent. But just to emphasize that oral history is as old as the hills, another distinguished historian who did rely partly on oral reflections was the venerable Bede in Northumbria. Writing in the first half of the 8th century AD his History of the English Church and People, Bede tells us, I am not dependent on any author, that's to say, a written source, but on countless faithful witnesses who either know or remember the facts. So Bede followed in the footsteps many centuries earlier of Herodotus. Since Bede has been before him, there have been countless examples of oral history. They include the spoken evidence of those women and young children in Scotland who so movingly described their daily experiences underground in the coal mines to the investigating parliamentary commissioners in 1840-42. The spoken testimony of those children illustrates, incidentally, that the recording of oral recollections doesn't have to be limited to the recollections of adults or elderly people. Developments, however, in the writing of history by professional historians from the early 19th century onward, particularly under the influence of the great German historian Leopold von Ranke, who lived practically throughout the entire 19th century, led them to place far greater emphasis on the need for the study and writing of history to be based upon documents. Two leading French historians even declared in 1898 that the historian works with documents. There is no substitute for documents. No documents, no history. Well, if, despite the pronouncements of those 19th century professional historians, oral history, the recording of spoken recollections, nonetheless does or can have a legitimate place when we try to explore aspects of the past, well, here, drawn from this book about Lily's Leaf, is a small example of that view. You may well be wondering anyway, by this time, when is he going to stop blathering on about Herodotus, Bede, Von Ranke, and A.G.P. Taylor, and get on with Lily's leaf? I see you nodding your head there. <laughs> <laughs> on the 17th of April, 1947, the Southern Reporter published an obituary of a Lily's leaf farmer who had recently died. The farmer, wrote the Southern, was of a cheery and sociable disposition and had hosts of friends outside the farming community. He was of a sunny, philosophic outlook and one seldom heard him complain. Now, a contrasting view of that same farmer's character is given in this book by Tam Borthwick, born at Lily's Leaf in 1907. Did you know him? 
and Tam died in the village in 1999. Now, Tam recalls being employed in the 1920s by the farmer mentioned in the Southern Reporter. Tam says, I'd be about 17 year old then. He'd to work six months at 10 shillings a week and your beat. And he didn't get paid or your six months was up. That was normal. But that farm was terrible. There were a brother and sister in it. They took their meals in the room and I was left to eat mine in the kitchen. Very, very seldom did they speak to eat. I came out in the morning and gave me orders to work like. He just got up in his cart and their high-stepping pony and away to the sale. And he came home drunk and whatnot. They'd what they called a hind, just another name for a ploughman, driving a pair of horse. Well, the hind was another young fellow for Lily's leaf. He was a single fellow. He'd be in his twenties. I think he left that firm after about a year and a half or something. He didn't abide long. Ah, was the old, the old laddie. And he had a servant lass working to her. She'd be badly treated to, they do. And it was a wind bothy he lived in. They stove into it or nothing in the winter time. Just the bothy. He came in there with your boots like. They were frozen in the bothy the next morning. No heat at all. No water either. Not at all. That's where he slept, behind the me, and that was it. There were no toilets. He'd have gone into the steam close or something like that. And I'll tell you something, you'll no believe this. Have you ever had screw nail soup? <laughs> well, I've had it at that farm. I'll tell you what happened. They had the big shelves in the pantry at the back door, a lot of pans and things. And her brother had come in, he'd been working with screw nails somewhere. And he just put the screw nails into the pan. His sister came then to make the soup. And she just put the stuff into the same pan. And that's how we got screw nail soup. <laughs> oh, it was a terrible place for meat. But then, if he broke your contact, contract, he lost your money. He had to do your six months or lost it. For these six months, well, just my grandfather in Lily's Leaf helped his out that way. And no money on my own at that time. And clothes, well, he had to get things made doom wells. Well, I left that farm and I went to Smedhew at Selkirk. And it was the same, six months there. But it was a grand meat shop, Smedhew. There's praise for Celtic. <laughs> when he went to Smedhew, the farmer and his wife sat down aside you and you had your meals all together. And the both of you, a fire in it and everything. It was like a mansion to us. Now, of those two conflicting views given by the Southern Reporter, and by Tam Borthwick about the character of the Lillysley farmer, which one strikes you as likely to be the more accurate? <laughs> and do those two differing accounts not indicate that whenever and wherever it's possible, both documentary and oral sources should be considered by the historian? It's difficult to be certain, of course, that Tam Borthwick spoke the truth and nothing but the truth. But I think those who knew Tom would certainly agree that he was, in general, an extremely truthful man with a very wide, exceptionally wide experience of employment. I think he was in about seven different occupations during his working life. Um, and it may tell you something about the Southern Reporter and it's the accuracy of its reports, at least at times. One of the criticisms that's often made of oral history is that it's unreliable because by its nature it's retrospective. That's to say people when interviewed are trying to very often or usually trying to recall events of maybe 
50, 60 or more years earlier. I, I remember once being in the presence of an, an old lady who, whose earliest memory, she told me, from about the age of five, was watching the Prussian soldiers marching down the Champs-Élysées at the end of the Franco-Prussian War in January 1871. Now, she couldn't say it really any more than that. She might have remembered the colour of their uniforms or what sort of weapons they had, they were carrying and so on. But, you know, that, that, that was a memory. Um, really of no historical significance or importance because all the world knows that was when the Franco-Prussian War ended and when the Prussian soldiers marched to the Champs-Élysées. But that's what's meant by um, a retrospective memory. You know, you're looking far back over many years. And how reliable is it when you're trying to remember what happened to you 60 or 70 years ago, uh, you know, some of the details maybe would be a bit hazy in general. Some people have photographic memories, of course, and uh, others of us, I speak for myself, <laughs> I'm under constant criticism by a certain party not sitting too far from here for forgetting their orders uh, every day of the week. So, is Oral history by its nature uh, unreliable because it's retrospective. Well, not necessarily so. Uh, minutes, letters, diaries, and other documentary sources are or are more likely to be contemporaneous. That's to say, these are documents written at the time of the events or the persons or whatever that they describe. But documents, we have to remember, are written by human beings, fallible human beings. So, for example, minutes may not or may not always be fully accurate or comprehensive accounts of what took place at the meeting uh, or the or meeting of the committee or the society or whatever uh, the minutes deal with. If the interval between the meetings of the organisation is maybe a month or more, then how many members can remember precisely what was said and agreed at the previous meeting? Nor, of course, is it entirely unknown for minutes to be edited, doctored or airbrushed by some self-interested person before the minutes are submitted for approval to the members of the organisation. Moreover, until maybe about a century and a half ago, minutes, diaries, letters, accounts and other documents were more generally uh, written and kept by official bodies, government, national and local churches, members of the upper classes, rather than by ordinary folk, such as mill workers, domestic servants, ploughmen, shop girls, coal miners and innumerable others, and by such of their organisations as trade unions, cooperative societies and working people's political parties. A great strength of oral history, therefore, is, or can be, that it opens up the experiences, the lives and struggles of so-called ordinary working people to investigation, recording, publication and broadcasting not only by professional historians, but also, of course, by local history societies and everyone else interested in the past and determined to explore it. Through oral history, much hitherto so-called hidden history can be revealed, not least about women, ethnic groups, working people, housing, schooling, health, customs and pastimes, war, and so on. That are within living memory. You can't go beyond living memory, but within living memory, a lot of what is not generally known can be revealed by interviewing those who experienced it, who were witnesses to it, who took part in these things. We're too late now, of course, to harvest any more spoken recollections by those men or women who were in the services during the 1914-18 war. 
Another example of this hidden history in the case of girls and women is revealed in the Lewis Eve book by Margaret Borthwick, the younger sister of Tam Borthwick, the farm worker. Margaret left Lewis Eve school, aged 14, at Easter 1935. She tells us, I was unemployed until, until I took this job in November. The place was Ettrick Hall Farmhouse. Hope the farmer's not here tonight. <laughs> Some critical remarks now follow. Um, so Ettrick Hall Farmhouse, says Margaret Borthwick, uh, nearly 20 miles above Selkirk, up the Ettrick Valley. Oh, what a place! And I was just a skivvy and a right one, she says. And of course folks said, oh, you'll be homesick. But you have to remember, we hadn't even travelled very much at that time. Travel was the widespread. And November, winter, oh, it was terrible. We didn't have much room at home in Lewis Eve, a button bed, a room and kitchen, but we were comfortable, we were warm. But up there at this Ettrick Hall farmhouse, when the farmer's wife showed me where I was to sleep, I didn't think that was where I was to sleep. She took me in there and I thought, it canny be this, it canny. There was a camp bed, and at the side of the bed, a chair with its back broken off. There was a mirror on the wall that had been an oval mirror, broken through the middle, and it was tilted on its side, and two bits of string on it. That was what was hanging on the wall for a mirror. The room had been a box room, but the window was the same size as in the other rooms. So it was a huge window and cold. Oh, it was terrible. There was no fire, no heating, nothing. I slept with a cardigan and ankle socks on to try and keep warm in this camp bed. I mean, it was the cover, frozen. The farmer used to give me a shout at five o'clock in the morning, but I was sometimes up at four o'clock writing a letter. I was that cold. He used to knock. He was all right, but no her. So I was up at five in the morning and plunged into the work at five. Why, it went on. At five o'clock, I'd go downstairs to the kitchen. We had a great big range, and that was my job, to separate the cinders from the ashes and get the, this big range going. And above there, there was a fellow who lived up there. Well, I say lived, he slept up there. You want to see his bedroom, I think it was even worse as mine. It was a little galley place where he slept. He worked on the farm, a nice fellow, he belonged to Bonchester. And on these dark mornings, you see, it was terrible. I mean, I was the used to be in out in places like that. Although we were brought up in a village, this was a wilderness. Well, when this farm worker used to hear me at the range at five o'clock in the morning, he knew it was time for him to get up, and when I heard his feet on the floor above, I used to think it was great, you know, somebody moving around. And oh, the work. And folk used to come to the door for milk in the morning, I was getting them milk, feeding the bairns, washing the floor and all the rest of it. You'd just be working all the time. You'd forever dishes or something or other. Well, he'd supper at night and all the rest of it. So you were working from five in the morning till between 10 or 11 at night. There was no recognized stopping time. There was nothing. That was seven days a week. Well, I worked on Sundays as well. I didn't get an afternoon off or anything. My wages were seven and sixpence. That's 37 and a half P a week. There was a saying that if you go offered 10 shillings, 50p a week, don't go. That was folk that was having difficulty finding anybody to work for them. I was 15 and I was too young to cope with that. Then the farmer's two older children were at the school, so I had to see to them, make pieces for them and see them off to school. Then he were left with two children at home, one in the pram and the other this little toddler. And then the wife didn't get up early in the morning. It was terrible. Oh, it must have been about eight o'clock when she came down the stairs. By then, I was carting armfuls of logs down for the fire, 
and all this carry on, filling them up and feeding the hens. You were wading through snow this height to feed the hens, <coughs> shutting the hens or whatever. Both different ways for the goose. An awful work. It was a big farmhouse, I think, all. Well, I think there was four or five bedrooms. And the kitchen floor was big, a big cement floor. <coughs> and that was all to wash. Oh, the work was tremendous. This was what I had to do every day. The wife just wasn't nice at all to me. Unsurprisingly, Margaret Borthwick handed in a month's notice and quit Ettrick Hall after three months' servitude there. When I was leaving, Margaret recalled, they didn't thank me. There was nothing. Now, could we expect to find this kind of spoken, recollected experience in any contemporary minutes, correspondence, or other documentary sources of, say, the Farmers' Union, Selkirk County Council, the Kirk Session, Women's Guild, or any other organisation, or indeed the Southern Reporter that found such cheerful, bright things to say about the Lindsley farmer. Incidentally, as you will have noticed, an attempt has been made throughout the book to preserve the actual words spoken by the successive veteran witnesses who contributed to it their memories of life and work at Lillysleaf during the 20th century. So the book is an attempt to present not only the history of the village and parish of Lillysleaf during the 20th century, but also the life histories of 24 of their older inhabitants or former inhabitants. Another aspect of life at Lillysleaf that illustrates, I hope, the value of oral history and which again provides details unlikely to have figured in contemporary reports in the Southern Reporter or other border newspapers was, can you guess, poaching. <laughs> now I'll not ask you to put up your hands if you've ever been engaged in that. <laughs> Rising in Ale Moor, flowing through Riddle Estate, then close by Lillysleaf until at Ancrum, it runs into the River Teviot. The ale water was where Lillysleaf poachers exercised their skills. Given low wages, large families, recurrent experiences of unemployment and other factors, it was the spoken view of more than one of the main contributors to this book that you had to poach to live. You had to. Will Young, a farm worker all his life, apart from a brief spell as a lorry driver and service in the RAF during the 1939-45 war, was third son in a family of ten children. Will says, I love fishing and I did a bit of poaching, even as a laddie. I think who was all poachers. He had to poach to live. He had to. Who did their fishing in the old ale water and a bit of poaching? I was catched yins. I think I was about 14 years old. I was going home to Riddle and I seen this couple of fish lying at the side of the water. Says I, have one of these the night. <laughs> so after I got the tea and when it was dark, I got the lamp and stick and away doon. I went doon below the two fish and I waded up and catched one of them. I was getting up over the bank and a voice at the top says, Would you like a hand up? Aye. <laughs> it was the dead bellies. <laughs> Two of them. I didn't they ken them. I didn't they want to ken them. <laughs> oh, the Tweed commissioners kept an eye on the ill water, as well as the Tweed, or the rivers. So they gave me a telling off. They tamed the lamp and stick and the fish and everything away from me. So I didn't get the fish but I got its mate the next night. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't long till my father got a letter from the sheriff doing it Jeddah. That I was never to go near the ale water again. Oh, my father gave us a good telling off. But I did go near the ale water again. I just ignored the sheriff's letter. I think my father was not too displeased I went back to the water again. 
That was the only time I was caught. I was never in the court, never find anything. I took precautions not to be caught again. Kept a watch, once bitten, twice shy. It was just sea trout and troots in the ill water. There are no salmon comes up there now. They used to come up when I was young. I caught one one Sunday morning. I was out fishing uh, and I seen this fish in a tree rit. And I went home and got this cleek and I got him out. And oh, it was a lovely one. Quite a big salmon. My father helped me to eat it. <laughs> he didn't give me a lecture then. <laughs> well, poached fish helped my mother feed the family. It was a big family. My father didn't have a big wage as a gardener. And when I started work, I didn't have a big wage myself. Sometimes my brother went poaching as well, but I was the main poacher. But oh, everybody poached in these days. He didn't see it as a crime, and there was a tug of war with the water bearings. As I say, everybody was poaching. They all knew in the village. Some of the poachers tried to sell the fish round the doors. But if he'd too money, he'd just give them away. I used to give fish to an old woman over there, Mrs. Curry. And then he used to hang a fish on the policeman's door <laughs> for him now and again. And he'd it. <laughs> there, was an, there was no interference by the village policeman. He didn't see that as his job. He left that to the bailiffs. <laughs> Another inveterate poacher was Bert Reed, youngest son of the publican of the Trustees Inn at Lewis Leaf. Bert, born in 1927, no doubt had less pressing financial or economic reasons for poaching than did Will Young. But Bert says, I poached fish for maybe I was 12 years old. Dazed until I had the banter and took a heart attack in 1986. Well, I had to poach fish. Even when I was 12, I was always looking for a fish. If I thought there were a fish in the river, I had to be out after. Later on, when I got a bit older, I've seen he's getting up at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, all the hours of the morning, away up to some of the buttons, and away down the river, out poaching with a large <coughs> click. It was usually on your own. It was always best to go on yourself. Well, my parents didn't mind. Well, they kept it was near us, so I just went anyway. Because I had to. I had to be there. It was maybe like the salmon themselves coming up the river. I felt I had to go down there. To me, the sport was terrific. I didn't sell salmon I caught. I just gave them all away. I'll tell you, there was never an old age pensioner I had to want for a fish when I was there. Bert Breed lived with his parents and two older brothers and on the upper floor of the Cross Keys Inn, at the Eve, until he got married. So he was in a good position there to observe and recall patrons of the inn. Among those patrons were men and women tramps. Bert says, there were a lot of tramps in the days before the war. There were a big, big lot of tramps came round the district. Oh, they toured round the boot. He could almost set your calendar by when he was going to see them again. It was the same folk. They came from Hoyk, Selkirk, Gala Shields. By the way, before the war, Selkirk County Council drew up an annual um, analysis, an annual account, an annual listing of the tramps in the county of Selkirk. Well, says Bert, they eat very little at times, some of them. Just what they could scrounge off some of the housewives. And that. But the funny thing is that they could all get their money for drink. Well, they came into the cross keys. They were often traps in the pub. My father didn't mind them coming in, no, no. Well, I think with some of them, they wouldn't really be born on the road. They would be unemployed at the end time and just take to this wandering. A lot of the real traps stick in my memory. Young real old worthy was Beck the Boar. Can I ask, does anyone here remember Beck the Boar? No, before your time. <laughs> I think her right name was Heber, but he never seen such a woman. She was a small woman. Her face was like leather. She always had the long old skirt he can and coats and shawls, oh well wrapped up, and always a hat. On her feet, oh, anything. 
Some days he can he meet her and she'd shoes on. Others maybe she'd a pair of old wellies, but just what anybody chucked out or she would get a hod of he kept. And she just slept anywhere, but the end place she used to go on to here, near Lillysleaf, was Millring Hall, a fern between Lillysleaf and Midland. And she slept in there in an old open fronted cared shed, summer and winter. A real hard, hard woman he kept. But the folk there at Millrig Hall was off again there for a meal like, and the eye let her sleep in there. It was three women that was in the fair then. Oh, they were good there. Well, she'd only stop the yin night, like there. Then she'd be away wandering the next day again. Oh, this the restless soul. She was always on her own. She didn't collect things, maybe empty jilly jars to sell them, no really. But she just knocked on doors and asked for water or bread. I never kept bet the board being ill. For I can mind her first, I reckon she must have been well into her fifties. She used to always talk about her family, but whether this was this something in her mind or no, I didn't care. But oh, bet the boar, she was an awful woman. What a character. Oh, she was a holy terror. She didn't come to the village a lot. Her main route was Midlam and Dunby Bowden Tolly came, and this the circle round about there all the time. Oh, an awful woman. Oh, oh, she took a drink and got a bit noisy and violent. Oh, she could be an nasty woman at times. Bert Reid could also remember clearly other women traps. Mary Tate was one, a big ginger headed woman. Oh, she was an awful woman there, Tate. She could be a violent person, her, when she had a pickled drink. Oh, she went into the cross keys. Another one, another young, always was called Big Bella. I think Bella Robertson would be her name. She was a holy terror. Oh, oh my God. Oh, she was a big woman, strong as only man. Well, the police in them days, about all they had today was watch the pubs and only of the traps. They seen standing about, they lift them again, they take them to Melrose. But I can mind of Fred Wiley, the village policeman, would go to lift Big Bella again for being drunk. And she would just get a hold of the policeman and put him right on the bane of his back. And Fred wasn't a wee lightweight soul either. <laughs> but Fred, he was scared for her, he kid. He used to get awfully excited if Big Bella was about the road. He used to get all worked up at Bella because he kind there'd be certain trouble if she was in the village. Big Bella tramped the countryside. And oh, every time Fred Wiley went to lift her, she used to put him down on, the, on his back. It's all right, she says. I'll come with you now. Oh, Big Bella was a horrible woman. She wasn't mentally unbalanced or anything, oh no. But oh, just a right evil woman. And I think she'd been born a tramp. I think she'd been born on the roads. Other tramps, known at Lily's Leaf and recalled by these older villagers, included Aggie Conroy and her companion, Huey, Scrubber, Sailor Jack, Jess Glensmills, Jean Norris, and Mitty Smith. Well, the recollections of these 24 men and women who lived and or worked at Lillysley during the 20th century may well be not radically different from many of the experiences of folk then in Selkirk, Denham, Hoyt, Yetham, or other border towns and villages. Some big social and economic changes there uh, have certainly been in Lillysley, village and parish, in that century. For instance, the rapid spread of car ownership after the Second World War and the almost simultaneous spread of big superstores at Gala Shields, Hoyt and other towns led to the disappearance of all shops in Lillysleaf by the end of the century. Although since then, the Jammy Koo Gallery and Coffee Shop has opened and is proving very successful. Markedly increased mechanisation of farming since the Second War led to the virtual disappearance of farm workers. Lonnie's Leaf also lost its resident parish minister, 
and its resident village head teacher. The village consequently attracted more professional people and more retired people. Younger folk have experienced much more difficulty than earlier in the 20th century in finding employment or housing at or around Lodisif and have moved, in some or many cases, to living in the towns. The introduction post-1945 of general secondary education resulted in, village, in Lodisif village school becoming solely a primary, its secondary pupils now attend Selkirk High School. By no means all of the 24 contributors to this book would, I think, have shared the view of the late Len Holding, one of the number, that, as he put it, the village has died. Perhaps there might be more agreement among the 24 with the view expressed by Kate Douglas, another of the number, that, oh, the atmosphere in the village is completely changed. No, for the better. It's a more lonely life than it used to be. I think we've lived through the happiest of it. We've seen the best of it. Well, if, as I very much hope, there are questions or any points that members would like to discuss, I'll be very happy to try to help answer the questions and discuss the points. Thanks very much. I said, Ian, quite happy to. So, has anybody got any questions? Any views? Can I just ask? say that the little as you when it became just a primary school, the secondary ones went down to Belsis to the train and went to Hoy High. Because I knew a lot of little as you children that went down to Belsis in a taxi from Chisholm mm -hmm. and then they went to Hoy High at that time. Yes, well, thanks. That's quite correct. Um, that process of going to Hoyt High actually began in 1918. Um, the first uh, veteran in the book, Johnny Elliott, a retired farmer who, uh, whose family had uh, two farms at those, these, the Middles and another one, um, he, <coughs> he recounts how, he's the oldest by the way of the 24, he was about 86, I think, 87 when I interviewed him, um, and he lived until he was about 90. Uh, he recalled, as you rightly say, four, four uh, boys of, of whom he was one, um, Willie Douglas, the fencer's son, um, a lad Robinson, and Jim Robinson, who later on became the postmaster in the village, and Andy Henderson, who was the son of the postmaster at that time. The four of them met every morning and cycled together to Belsies, got on the train, attended the high school, and did the, the, the journey in reverse, as it were, in the evening. It was a long day, so they didn't get home to have something to eat till about 7 p.m., depending you know, on the times the train ran. So you're, you're quite correct there. And that, I'm not quite sure. Um, I should have asked and I failed to do that. When the changeover to going to Selkirk High School from Hoyt High School began, but there was also, I think, an interim period when some of the pupils went to Denham School, which was a junior secondary, I think. That must have been maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing here, yeah, sometime in the 50s or early 60s. But you're quite right. You're quite right. But the process of going to secondary school really began in 1918 because of an education act that was passed just at the end of the First World War. And uh, Mary Preston was another person. She went in a, a, a hired car along with, I think they were all girls who went the year that Mary began there. This was a nurse. Who, of course, she became a nurse. And she <coughs> left Port High School in her fourth year when she was 16 and then started training as a nurse. So you're quite right in what you see. But it began in 1918, that process. Before then, all the pupils attending Lovisif public school until they were 14. Thanks very much.